day two of Open Aperio 2019. Now that housekeeping is, housekeeping is handled largely by an app, I don't have much to say except let's harmonize the hashtags. Aperio 19, please. I also wanted to take the opportunity to, to mark the retirement from Stanford University of someone who really played a formative part in where we are today. Almost 20 years ago, uh, at EDUCORS 1999, there was a meeting that was really the genesis of what was then the Java and Special Interest Group, JSIG. JSIG acted as a beacon for the schools that later coalesced to create Sakai, a beacon and an example. And this guy, Art Pasconelli, and I hope he's watching the recording, uh, just retired from Stanford. He was at Sun Microsystems. He acted as uh, a principal sponsor of JSIG. He provided funding for meetings for several years and really helped us all get moved on and forward. So I wanted to note that because I think it's important that gatherings like this actually reflect a collective memory. Second short announcement. I am pleased to report that we have four new board members. Thierry Kozilniak from CNAM in Paris. Salvador Pelica, you're here. I can't see for the lights. Wave, Salva. Matthew Raskoff, Associate Vice Provost for Digital Education and Innovation at Duke University. And Laura McCord, Senior Technical Lead at Rice University, who represents individual members. Give them a big hand and thank them in advance for their service. And I also note that this marks another important contribution to the diversity that we represent as a community. And we have a very diverse leadership and a, an international and global leadership. So I'm going to talk this morning. Uh, in a way, this is an extended riff on some of the points that Tanis made yesterday. And we have one or two slides in common, although we did not plan it that way. So I'm going to talk about platforms and privacy and developing open approaches in higher education. There's a health warning. There are no puppies in my slides. Sorry. But there is a cat, my cat. This is a personal take. This isn't the position of the Aperio Foundation. It's not a position of the board. What I'm about to say is my thoughts only, incomplete as they are. And I pose more questions than answers. Uh, I'll give you a warning when the cat appears in case there are any felinophobes in the audience. Uh, and there's a direct question for you at the end. So there is a quiz. Uh, it's a pretty simple one. So every year, EDUCORS, the association that represents a lot of higher ed IT in North America and around the world, poll their members for top 10 issues. Interesting, I think that this year privacy popped in there, having not been in the results of this survey ever before, at number three. Now, this might be the result of the impending legislation in California. It might be a result of GDPR last year, which brought a lot of things to folks' attention. But the fact is that privacy is a live topic. It might seem odd for me to be talking about openness and privacy together, because it might appear at first glance that that's not a particularly good fit. So I hope I demonstrate, in some small way at least, the connection and the intimate connection that I believe lies between the two. I'm going to talk a little bit about developing an open response to privacy as an issue and what's happening in terms of the platforms that were mentioned yesterday. I'm going to dwell at that on some length with some evidence. And I'm going to bring in some of the lessons, early lessons, from the learning analytics work that Aperio has been involved in around the Shahari software stack, which uses predictive analytics, and around OnTask, new incubating project, going to leave incubation shortly, I think, uh, which doesn't use predictive analytics, but it is in that broad area. So when I was growing up, a long time ago in a galaxy far away. Well, several time zones anyway. These were the kind of dystopic views that we had. 
you know, I mean, I don't know how many of these you've read. Weave by Zamyatin is probably not that well known. Uh, Brave New World in 1984, much, much better known. But essentially, you know, we were looking at Watergate era paranoia. Gene Hackman, The Conversation, who's seen that? Great classic. Uh, cl oh, you, that's not many. Go we watch it, it's good. Somewhat later, the kind of bad state actors that were represented by the former East German regime, and if you've not seen The Lives of Others, I'd recommend that as a movie also. But, you know, these days we have memes. We're not so concerned, apparently, about wiretaps. We talk to them. We ask them recipes for pancakes. Is a pancake worth sacrificing privacy for? Well, that's a good question. Perhaps we can answer that collectively. I'm going to quote Shoshana Zuboff from Harvard quite a lot in the course of this presentation. I'll mention the book that this came from in a short while. But essentially, we were looking the wrong way. We were looking at the overweening power of the state as a threat. But actually, this left us entirely unprepared to defend ourselves from new companies with imaginative names run by young geniuses that seemed unable able to provide us with exactly what we yearn for at little or no cost. Two books published this year are a signal of the attention that is starting to be paid to the emergence of platforms like Google, Facebook, Amazon. Age of Surveillance Capital by the person I just mentioned, Shoshana Zuboff from Harvard, Future Histories, interesting subtitle, What Ada Lovelace, Tom Paine and the Paris Commune can teach us about digital technology. Both are worth reading. Uh, the one on your left is a somewhat tougher read than the one on your right. I'm not going to read these to you, but surveillance is becoming a common mode. Google no longer mine behavioral data to improve their product. They mine behavioral data to sell you things and help others sell you things. And there's a growing awareness of the scandalously invasive way in which this surveillance works. And that's not just in thick volumes by academics and others. It's working its way into the news media in very serious ways. And we are not exempt in education. Learning analytics is an area which is disputed by many. It's right that we enter that conversation. But questions like this are posed around the world every week and every day. Turnitin was mentioned yesterday, and this is not a new problem. This is from an article in 2010. Who owns the data? What's it there for? Piazza, a business model that exists solely around selling data. And Phil Hurlow's blog I just quoted said, if you quote, made the famous quote, if you're not paying for the product, you are the product. It's not quite like that. It's not to say that the users are products, but we are the source of raw material supply. They are mining our data. This quote appeared yesterday. It's from a, a, a website called 1KG, which is a, essentially a higher education policy news source in the UK. And I think it points to a serious danger that we're only recently becoming aware of. Uh, it may be that we find ourselves positioned as educational product providers and data collection partners for the new HE industry. Is that an extreme position? Well, actually, I don't think so. It's a position we have to recognize. Look at the recent earnings call from Instructor and Canvas is being positioned around machine learning and AI. The components that they're developing is based on machine learning and artificial intelligence. What are these going, going to do exactly? Why is it important? Well, it's important, and this slide appeared yesterday as well, when you look at the numbers of students that the platform companies are capturing data from, and I think the Instructure Earnings Call really revealed plans to become 
a platform like Google, like Facebook, when you look at that data, that, they're serious numbers. 32 million students? What are they doing with the data? So we have other commentators who point to the warning signs that those numbers indicate and talk about the weaponization of education data. So where does that leave us? Where does that leave the learners and academics that we serve? Well, I think a good many probably just feel like this, caught up in the machine, wrapped in the cogs. So what can we do about it? Well, we can take a deeper dive for a moment, if you don't mind. Let's remind ourselves of what algorithms are. So we take a dictionary definition of an algorithm, and it looks kind of neutral, doesn't it? A process or a set of rules to be followed in calculations or other problem-solving operations, especially by a computer. Well, that sounds nice and neutral. Let's take another perspective on that. I worked as a mathematician, and then as a quant in finance, I saw the worst of finance. I went into data science, and I was struck by what I thought was essentially a lie, namely that algorithms were being presented and marketed as objective fact. A much more accurate description of an algorithm is that it's an opinion embedded in math. Um, an algorithm is a very general concept. It's something that we do actually in our heads every day. To build an algorithm, we need only two things, essentially, a historical data set and a definition of success. So I build an algorithm to cook dinner for my family. The data that I use on a daily basis is the ingredients in my kitchen, sometimes the time I have, the ambition I have for that dinner. And then I assess the dinner after the fact. Was it a success? I define that because I'm the one who's building the meals. I'm in charge. I have the power. So there's always a power element here. So I get to decide a meal is successful if my kids ate vegetables. My kids, if they were in charge, would have defined it differently. And it matters because as we optimize over time, we optimize to success. The succession of meals that I cook from month to month is a very different path of meals than if my son were in charge. So we do that every time we build algorithms. We curate our data, we define success, we embed our values into algorithms. So when people tell you algorithms make things objective, you say no. Algorithms make things work for the builders of the algorithms. In general, we have a situation where algorithms are extremely powerful in our daily lives, but there's a barrier between us and the people building them. And those people are typically coming from a kind of homogeneous group of people who have their particular incentives. If it's, if it's in a corporate setting, usually profit, and not usually a question of fairness for the people who are subject to their algorithms. So we always have to penetrate this fortress. We have to be able to question the algorithms themselves, especially when they're very important to us. We have to inject ethics into the process of building algorithms, and that starts with data scientists um, agreeing and signing a Hippocratic Oath of modeling. But we have to stop blindly trusting algorithms to be fair. They are not inherently fair. And start looking into what they're actually doing. Opinions embedded in code. I think that's a very valuable perspective and one which we should remind ourselves of, but also remind others of, because we're not about a blind faith in technology. We're about understanding the technical in technology, but also should be concerned with societal impacts. So if you're not worried yet, let's look a little bit more closely. What could possibly go wrong? So this is my blooper reel, and some of you may have seen a few slides in this before. Uh, there's no shortage of material. So, a bit of comedy value, first of all. How algorithms pushed a book on evolutionary biology to the Amazon price that is represented there. A little more seriously, once upon a time, Google predicted where flu outbreaks would happen by looking at who was searching for flu symptoms. But then, when flu symptoms actually were inserted in the equation, it went very badly wrong. 
140% error in 2013 at the peak of the flu season. Rather more seriously, if Tesla autopilot sensors and algorithms fail to identify a white truck against a white sky, it leads to a tragedy. How do you feel about quotes like this from leaders in the field? Big data requires that information. It's not non-negotiable. Individual privacy is gone for the common good, or perhaps the common profit. Who remembers this? Google Street Map went around not just recording photographs, but peeking into open Wi-Fi networks. It took ages to get the proof for this, but in the end, Google conceded that this was a fairly serious violation of privacy. Facebook, well, turning to Facebook, really, I mean, you know, I subscribe to the Financial Times in the UK. I think it's probably the best UK newspaper. Certainly, its technology section is really good. It's not, not inexpensive, but it's, it's quality. I don't think there has been a day this year where there hasn't been an article in the Financial Times about Facebook and some entirely egregious misuse of user data, or an attempt to misuse, because sometimes you get found out. You give apps sensitive personal information, and they inform Facebook. Facebook planned to spy on Android, Android phone users. Facebook pressured Canada to ease up on data rules, UK reports say. Hmm, what's that about? Well, they're lovely people, Facebook senior execs. If you don't do what we want you to do, you'll end up in hospice. Which drew this response from New Zealand's privacy commissioner, who, in my experience of the New Zealand government, are usually very restrained. Perhaps this was restrained. No, don't hold back, New Zealand privacy commissioner. Tell us what you really think. We then have the future is private, a new turn. Except last week, this was around. Facebook says social media users can't expect privacy. This was in court last week. And Bloomberg Business Week, I think, did it about right, the apology machine. I'll give you a moment to, uh, to look at the code. I could go on. I've got probably 57 slides with stuff about Facebook, all drawn from newspapers around the world. This is one of my photographs. It's in the city center of Kingston-upon-Hull in the UK, where I live. And from where I stood and took this photograph, I could see, I think, 27 or 28 masts like this. They're CCTV cameras. I live in probably one of the most surveilled countries in the world. It would make the East German government envious, form, former East German government. And what's all this stuff used for? Well, big part of it is facial recognition and alleged crime prevention. Uh, Met, Met Police a couple of years ago, 104 alerts, two confirmed to be positive matches. Staggeringly inaccurate software. using algorithms to forecast where crimes are likely to occur and who might commit them. Well, if algorithms are not the neutral things that, in popular opinion, they, they often are, and they're written by people, fallible people, then this is slightly problematic. We're not here yet. Neither, I think, on the basis of the evidence, are we getting there. But, you know, again, from my hometown, there are other approaches to fighting crime. If you're housebreaking, it's not a good idea to take a bite out of a cucumber in the kitchen of the house you're breaking into and then put it back in the fridge. But it did lead to a burglar being caught. And again, recently, a uh, few days ago, San Francisco, interesting that it's San Francisco, given its proximity to Silicon Valley, is the first city in the US to ban facial recognition. Interesting. 
Here's a use of CCTV in education in China. Putting CCTV in dormitories. Phenomena such as playing with phones, napping or chatting during class have virtually disappeared. Hmm. From a similar slide that Tanish showed yesterday, researchers at a couple of US universities photograph students to give a realistic data set for facial recognition. That data set was then made publicly available for three years before being taken down. Students are becoming aware of this. And not surprisingly, are growing concerned with this. Oniswire is a weekly student newspaper of the University of Sydney, Australia. The Living Laboratory, how the university watches your every move. Privacy is the obvious concern, and the extent to which students have meaningfully consented to what's happening is dubious. And consent is a theme that I'm going to return to uh, later. One of the probably most direct illustrations of issues with algorithms and their imperfections came several years ago. Google mistakenly tagging black people as gorillas, showing the limits of algorithms. How are you doing with that, Google? Well, earlier this year, not too well. And as I was finishing putting the slides in the facial recognition section of this presentation together last week, I received an email asking me, a week before a conference begins, whether I wanted to replace our sign-up facility with a computer with facial recognition technology so you could all check into the conference early. Well, I mean, I know checking into conferences is an arduous business. It's time-consuming. You know, it takes, well, minutes. Uh, it went into my wastebasket when I'd copied it. It's not a new controversy, this. And we need to look at history to, in order to understand it. Who can tell me what that is? Yep. Thanks, Martin. Hollow Earth card. In 1936, it became mandatory for each Dutch municipality to maintain a demographic record of its inhabitants. By 1939, each citizen had to carry a person card or personal identity card. Both included a field for heritage, and the registry was contained on Horrath cards. What came after 1939? Thinking of uh, almost invoking Godwin's law here. 1940 happened after 1939. And when the Germans occupied the Netherlands at the start of the war, they found the registry of Hollerith cards that included heritage. And that led to pretty serious tragedy. It also led to the targeting of what I, I suppose one must regard as an early data center. Uh, the resistance targeted the public record office in order to prevent Further tragedy. Thanks to Frank Benneker from the University of Amsterdam for pointing me, that out to me, actually, because I, I, didn't, I wasn't aware of it. We often don't celebrate acts of resistance. Has it gone away? No. Again, China, national social credit system. People will be penalized for the crime of spreading online rumors. This will ensure that bad people in society don't have a place to go to, while good people can move freely and without obstruction. Who is defining bad and good in this context? Does that impact education? Well, sometimes. Think about the Ed Moda acquisition. Again, an example from the UK. University students' data, it's been determined by the Office for Students, I don't know whether Office for Students is the right name for this agency. Information on declared mental and physical health conditions, academic progress, graduate employment, and earnings of all university students can be shared with companies such as Pearson. 
So, we're seeing legal reactions to this, quite rightly. Uh, last year, very notably, the EU enforced the General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR, led to a lot of purging of mailing lists, a great deal of concern in education. Um, it's interesting, I think, that the geographical reach of this is to any entity processing the data of an EU resident. I don't want to go through the GDPR in a lot of detail. I'll mention a bit more in a moment. Uh, and one of the important aspects of GDPR is it's no longer possible simply to include a shrink wrap license and enforce it. Interesting statistic I came across for the average North American. If you read the privacy policies you encounter in a year, who reads them all, by the way? I see no, oh, I see no hands. 76 working days to read all the privacy policies that you would come across in shrink wrap software licenses. Yeah. So here he is, sorry, didn't give you the warning. Didn't give you the warning. If you avert your eyes, too late. But in a very real sense, the technology cat is out of the bag. That was my cat. I didn't put him in the bag, by the way. I'm not um, cruel to, to felines. So what can we do? Can we uninvent this stuff? No, we cannot. Can we influence and control it? Well, it may be too late for that, but I'd argue that we should have a darn good try, particularly in our corner of the space, in education space. Uh, there are examples of, for example, learning analytics software identifying students that are about to fail and helping prevent them fail. Do we have the right to ignore that evidence? What safeguards are in place and what safeguards can we put in place as we proceed with this work if we do? Well, we got some early lessons from our learning analytics work uh, and really I've called this eight dimensions of openness I think Chuck at one point called this, or the slide with all the opens on it. Be clear about the why of what we're doing. Be clear and open about the why of what we're doing. Have a clear and developing ethical framework. And if you want to see an example of this, look at the JISC website in the UK and look at the ethical framework that they worked up around learning analytics. Look at the work that Tanis referred to yesterday from an Aperio member of the University of Edinburgh on ethics. This stuff is foundational. It doesn't get layered on at the end. You have to begin with it. As you implement, be open and inclusive about governance. Include learners, include faculty. Hmm. Whatever's. I think there's a clear role for open source software in this space. I might not be able to look at the code and see what it's doing, but I know a bunch of people who can, who I trust. Think open platforms and open architecture for the same reason, and also because a lot of this stuff is early and you want the possibility of change. Ditto open standards. Open algorithms. I'm going to dwell on this for a few minutes uh, in a moment and what the implications are. But also, think about consent and consent management as we go forward. Because there's a widening perception that uh, consent and consent management are necessary. How well do we manage consent? Well, in the GDPR, if your software does automated decision making, or if it handles sensitive information, which is defined as a political perspective, uh, what the Dutch person card called heritage, ethnicity, if 
you're doing that, you need the, using that, you need the user's consent. What more do we need? What level of granularity? How well does your institution handle consent now? And that's got both a mechanical aspect, the mechanics of handling consent, in a world where we're all encouraged to believe that, for example, the learning management system is going to become more flexible and standards and specifications like LTI are there to help that. But it makes stuff like consent much more complex. How are we handling that? What if an LTI tool keeps data in a different jurisdiction? We need to think about these things. There's also uh, an element of this which is profoundly educational. How well do we help our learners become aware of big data? How well do we help our learners become aware of the power of algorithms? How well informed are they about their purposes and rights? And that's profoundly not a mechanical thing. It's not about a granular means of consenting and withdrawing consent. If you uh, consider that for a while, it doesn't mean that we have to get all our learners to become data scientists. More general awareness is called for. If you are interested in this area at all, I would recommend uh, this paper by some folks from the Open University in the UK. Uh, explains the impact of algorithms, enables recourse and subject action. So it's put in terms of you were denied a loan because your annual income was £30,000. If your income had been 45000 you would have been offered a loan. So it's an interesting approach, the counterfactual approach. So those who produce software, including open source communities like ours, should be aware of the ethical dimensions of the things that we make. Tanis mentioned ethical ed tech yesterday. It's a great source. Uh, they have a Zotero site, which is packed full of stuff to read. Or we'll follow that, look for that hashtag. We this year have looked very closely at the ethical operating system material. I'm not sure how much of a genuine campaign this is, but the material that's being produced is very valuable. We are actually building this into our incubation process so that incubating projects at least should review this material and look at these different areas which are helpful. Uh, not all of them apply, of course, to software that we produce, but if you look at our learning analytics work in particular, some of these things like machine ethics and algorithmic biases, surveillance state, yeah, really we should be looking at this. Our community should be looking at this stuff. Also, follow work my campaigning groups like the Algorithmic Justice League. That's a great name. Love it. Safe Face Pledge Launch. Be looking at that more closely. So as we proceed, we can improve our own practice. We can look at the ethical dimensions of the software we, we create. Open algorithms in practice. Well, this is a complex area. It's all very well to publish an algorithm openly so that people can examine it. But what needs to accompany that? Well, probably anonymized training data, if anybody's going to look, uh, look at it seriously. I'll ask the question again. How well do our institutions manage consent? And we're having a conversation with JISC about an open consent platform. It's not moving very quickly at present. But there's room, I think, for much, much better management of consent at an institutional level, and we can play a role in a community in that. And if you're interested in that work, then drop me a line. We can build dialogue and partnerships with other agencies around the world who are concerned about the same issues, and we're actively doing that. And I think we need to have dialogue across the broad higher education community internationally that comes up with a, a response to this. We clearly have a role to play in helping educate educators in spreading these issues amongst faculty, amongst academic staff. And really, we also have to consider, I think, in the longer term, curriculum changes. 
there's been a lot of talk around the Society of Learning Analytics Research hackathons over the last three or four years about algorithmic literacy, not just data literacy, so that learners become more aware of those issues about algorithms that I've talked about and, and others. Agency in sociology is the capacity of individuals to act independently and make their own choices. And I think that we need to bear in mind as we create the software that we create that we should be acting to facilitate agency and not constrain it. And with that, I'd like to conclude and hand it over to you. But before I do, I said there should be there would be a question. It's only one question really, so after you've heard me speak, should I put this on or should I take it off? <laughs> Who thinks I should be wearing it? It's a kind of Yorkshire flat tin hat that. <laughs> Wear it. Okay, take the picture then. That's right. Comments, questions, I've been as provocative as I can be. No, not quite. So I'm really glad, uh, great talk by the way. Um, I, I'm, you are talking to the choir, I think, in this room. I mean, if there was one reason to be an open source, it's to have control, I have our campuses control our data and not just hand it to people. I, I, the slide I think that is the most terrifying slide is the Edmodo slide, because that means that 55 million children from nine years old to 15 years old now have all their homework and papers in the hands of the Chinese government as for a hundred, mere $150 million. Um, and my, my dream is that a CIO of a university that, that hands their students' entire data through a series of dominoes falling to China uh, is convicted of a felony and CIOs begin to go to jail for making these kinds of irresponsible, uh, and they're just incompetent CIOs that don't even understand what technology is because they didn't have a technical degree, they've never read a lot of code in their life, and they're pure political creatures and that are, that are doing the minimum they possibly can do to get through their daily job, but without any understanding of the importance of what they're doing. And I just, I think the Edmodo thing should be the thing that scares us the most, that these cloud companies with a single check can be handed to the Chinese government. And so thank you for including that. Any comments on that from anybody or other comments or questions? I mean, I, from my own perspective, uh, yeah, I kind of agree, I kind of agree with you. But I think some of those other slides, particularly the historical stuff, show how dangerous it is for any government to have the amount of data that they're accessing. Wow, we're going to be through early this morning. Martin. I'll throw something provocative out there. Um, I've been a fan of Shoshana Zuboff for a long, long time, and The Age of the Smart Machine was one of the early books of hers that I read that I was quite impressed with. But she says that companies have kind of snuck up on us, I'm paraphrasing badly here. We knew governments were an issue, we've known that for centuries, but we didn't know companies were an issue. Yeah. And, and maybe, maybe we should think about that, comment about that. Um, do we, is, is regulation the answer? Do governments control companies and therefore we have, you know, the, the fox watching the chicken house, so to speak, or what's the answer there? Your turn, Ian. Well, I don't, I don't have an answer to that. Um, 